Good morning. If you guys could stand and sing with us this morning. Merry Christmas. Welcome. It's great to have you here. If you're visiting with us, uh, it's awesome that you're here this morning. I see some people have family home for the holidays and others are away visiting other family for the holidays. Uh, There's no children's church today, so we have the pleasure of having all of the young ones up here with us for the whole service. Um, Ask for a little bit of grace. If you notice any of your elders are tired, we were at the church until one o'clock this morning because there was another break in here. Um, so just asking you to pray for the people that, that did that, for where they're at and the needs that they have, um, that they'd be willing to do that. Uh, the soup kitchen is open tomorrow from 9 a.m. till noon for breakfast, and everyone is welcome. So if you don't have somewhere to be tomorrow morning or you're looking to spend some time with others or you know other people who are, uh, pass that along, 9 to noon at the soup kitchen in town. Loved by the bull. And we have a video announcement this morning. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum. And you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're gonna look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right Now Media. It's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. 
The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. So I want to tell you about some free Bible study videos and resources uh, I'm excited to share that our church now has unlimited access to Right Now Media. It's the world's largest streaming library of video Bible study resources. This extensive library has more than 20,000 videos taught by a variety of leaders. Uh, the Bible study videos can be used as part of a group study or for personal devotions, and many series also include free discussion guides and handouts. Our hope is that Right Now Media can be a tool to help you live out your faith in every area of your life, at home, at work, and in your community. Uh, in addition to series on books of the Bible, Right Now Media has videos for everyone in your family on a variety of topics like marriage, parenting, personal finances, mental health, and more. And there's even a library just for kids with over 2,000 safe and entertaining videos. That includes programs like Superbook, The Torchlighters, The Pilgrim's Progress, The Story Keepers, and Adventures in Odyssey. So if you're a parent or a grandparent, uh, this could be a regular helpful resource for you. Uh, right now, Media has an app. It's available on all major streaming devices, so you and your family can access the content anytime, anywhere. You should have received an email invitation this morning for free access. If you haven't received it, check your spam folder. Uh, to get started, simply click that link, create your free account, start browsing, and uh, there's also posters up around the church. They have a QR code. You can scan that, and it takes you right to the login. So that's unlimited free access for everybody that's part of the church, connected with the church. So please uh, take advantage of that. Go check it out. Look around. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there. So we're praying that right now media will be a blessing to you and your family. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 28, Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to gather here to celebrate the birth of our Savior, to spend time in song and praise and fellowship. What a beautiful gift. This time of year, we think about the gift of a Savior. We think about this precious baby lying in a manger and all that that entails. And Lord, all the gifts that you continually bless us with each day beyond that. Thank you for this time together. May our songs and our worship and the proclamation of your word be a sweet and fragrant offering to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, invite Leslie to come up for Advent. The people walking in darkness 
seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness has dawned. Isaiah 9, 2. Why do we light the fourth candle? The fourth candle reminds us that God demonstrated his love by sending his son Jesus to be born in a manger and suffer and die for our sins, so we may live forever with him. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life.
I announced that there was no children's church this morning, but there is still a toddler nursery available downstairs if you need that. How are you doing this morning? (laughs) That's good, Ken. Are you excited? Exhausted? Grieving? Rejoicing? And whether or not you like the holiday celebrations, are you feeling ready for everything to slow down a bit? It's great to spend time with family and friends, to give and receive gifts, to host and attend special meals and all the other things that we do this time of year, but all too often I hear expressions of exhaustion. Even those who love this time of year start talking about how they're ready for the holiday season to be over. And certainly for many, amidst the joys of the holiday season, there's sadness as you remember those who are no longer here to celebrate with you. Christmas is an interesting time of year, isn't it? We experience great highs and deep lows. We talk of love, peace, joy, and hope. We focus more on helping others. We highlight the importance of family and friends, and we spend time in celebration. We also seem to feel our hurts more significantly. Whatever we're lacking seems more readily in our face. We can simultaneously experience the heights of joy and the depths of sorrow. And of course, some people experience one of those more significantly than the other. And so this morning, I understand that we aren't all sitting here thinking and feeling the same way. We haven't all had the same experiences, and there's a variety of moods and mindsets present. And whether you're here full of joy or struggling to hold it all together, I'm glad that you're here today. Because this morning, a large reason why we're gathered together is to shift our focus from ourselves to our amazing God. And while we focus on His Word, we should be able to find true peace, hope, and joy this morning. There's something available to us today. Rest for our weary souls. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Maybe an unconventional Christmas passage. We're going to read verses 13 to 17. I ask that if you're able, you would stand with me as we reverence the public reading of God's Word. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at a table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning, for this opportunity to be here together to look into your word. Lord, give us understanding. Encourage our hearts. Captivate us, Lord, that we would look to you and we would see your great love. We'd see the beauty of that exists for us in this Christmas season. Lord, you preach your word to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. We pray, amen. And you may be seated. Most of you are probably aware that I have a deep respect and appreciation for first responders. 
I have a pretty intimate understanding of a variety of emergency responder positions. Now, one of the reasons that I love first responders is because they willingly enter messes and problems. They run into danger. I think about paramedics, firefighters, and police officers. When you're experiencing the worst day of your life, when a loved one is unconscious, when your child is trapped in a burning building, when someone breaks into your house or church or threatens to harm you, what do you do? Among other things, you call 911. And what do they do? They respond. Even though they have family waiting for them back home, even though they're putting themselves at risk, even though their service requires a number of sacrifices, they respond. Now, I want you to think about this. If you weren't in danger, you wouldn't need rescuing. If you weren't in trouble, you wouldn't need help. First responders wouldn't have to sacrifice and serve if there wasn't a need. With those thoughts in mind, let's take a look at our passage. My real focus is verse 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. At Christmas time, we think about the birth of Jesus. Truly, we think about God incarnate coming to earth, and it's such a beautiful thought. A beautiful picture. But if we slow down and ask why, it's actually a pretty astonishing story. You see, Jesus came for a reason. Now, I think that we need to be careful when we try to understand God through human pictures, metaphors, similes. But sometimes these pictures can give us helpful understanding, even if only a glimpse. And so just as first responders answer the call and run into trouble, Jesus answered the greatest and most desperate call of mankind. And he responded. His birth had a glorious purpose. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And as we think about all this today, I have a couple points for us to consider. Number one, we have a problem. If you look through the Bible at the reasons that Jesus was born, you'll find a lot of descriptions about humanity, like lost, broken, blind, sick, weak, needy, and dead. Not a flattering list. Now look at today's text. Jesus approaches a tax collector named Levi. Matthew 9 identifies him as Matthew. And he says, follow me. And they went and they sat at a table in Levi's house. Not only was Levi there, but there were many tax collectors and others who were viewed to be sinful and wicked. Now remember, tax collectors were particularly undesirable and disliked. I think to some extent we can understand why. But it's something that we need to understand for this story. Tax collectors were hated and they were viewed as sinful scum. But here Jesus was with his disciples, sitting, eating, relaxing among all of these undesirables. And of course, the religious leaders did what religious leaders do and they judged the actions of Jesus. Look at verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I think this is one of the many times that the Pharisees figured that they'd caught Jesus in a compromising situation. They figured that they'd finally discovered something that would have him labeled as a heretic or a false teacher. And I I love verse 17. I know we've already read it, but... And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. 
This is huge. Jesus contrasts those who are well with those who are sick and those who are righteous with those who are unrighteous. And we could actually spend so much time in the words of Jesus here, all the different implications of what he's saying, how people could perceive these words. But the one point that I want us to consider for today is how every person in the world is spiritually in the undesirable category of Jesus' comparisons here. Every person is the sick and the unrighteous, whether we realize it or not. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And 1 John 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So what we need to understand is that all humanity is in great need of a Savior. As Jesus said in the passage, the sick are in need of a physician. I don't know if you've ever been in a serious situation requiring you to call 911. But those scenarios are usually not very good. Sometimes they're the worst and scariest moments of our lives. And yet, no reason that anyone has ever dialed 911 compares to the desperate sickness of humanity. Sin. Romans 6.23 starts by saying, for the wages of sin is death. But this isn't just physical death, it's so much more, so much worse. It's eternal, it's separation from the presence, from the glory, from the grace of God. At least his presence in the positive sense. And in this situation, there's no doctor we can call. No firefighter or paramedic to save the day. No police officer to come and rescue us. We're doomed. And if, unlike the Pharisees and those who view themselves as righteous, we understand that we're sick and unrighteous, then we're desperate. Desperate for rescue. This is where our Christmas celebrations come in. Number two, help has arrived. We talk a lot about gifts and presents at Christmas time, but there's only ever been one gift worthy of timeless rejoicing and praise. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why was Jesus born? Because we desperately needed him and because the Father willingly gave him up. For who? For the sick, for the unrighteous, for you and I. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul, who was an apostle, previously trained and practiced as a prominent Pharisee, said, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. This truly is great news this morning. And it's great news no matter where you're at in life, whether you're living a fairly good life, making good choices, and have a good reputation, or if you're strung out, coming off a bender, or just an all-around mess. Jesus entered the mess. He didn't sit off in an ivory tower somewhere, allowing only the prestigious and perfect to draw near to Him. He didn't relax in comfort, watching people suffer while doing nothing. He wasn't some disengaged bystander. He answered the call. He responded. He ran into danger and devastation. He stopped the stoning of a prostitute. He spoke to the adulterous woman at the well. He regularly walked among the broken and healed the sick and unclean. 
In our passage today, he relaxed and ate with despised sinners with bad reputations. So however good or bad you may think you are, I have news for you. It doesn't matter. Jesus came for the sick who need a physician. He came for the unrighteous who need a savior. So no matter how unrighteous, unworthy, or unlovable you think you are, Jesus came for you. And no matter how righteous, worthy, and great you think you are, Jesus came for you too, and you desperately need him as well. Number three, Merry Christmas. The birth of Jesus is an incredible gift. But the gift of God didn't end there. Earlier I said that like a first responder, Jesus entered into the mess and devastation. He willingly ran into danger. Well, that was actually the very reason that he was born in the first place. He came so that he could suffer and die in our place. Suffer rejection and hate and torture and die a cruel and horrible public execution. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Earlier in John 3.16, we saw that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And this is incredible love. Love beyond anything I think I could ever replicate. I have three sons. I cannot imagine giving one of them up to save someone else. I can't imagine sending them away knowing the absolute agony and torture they would experience on behalf of someone else. But I don't love perfectly. I'm human. I love selfishly. And I love selectively. And I love conditionally. You can ask my wife. But not God. He loves with a perfect love. A kind of love that's beyond my comprehension. In John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now this is the kind of love that we're called to, and it's the kind of love that Jesus modeled. In fact, he went above and beyond this call to love because he gave himself up even for those who mock and ridicule him and spit in his face. He sacrificed himself so that even those who hate him could repent and find salvation in him. So Merry Christmas. The blood of Jesus was shed for you. His body hung on a cross in your place. He was born on this earth all so that he could die for you. What a precious gift. You've received the greatest gift imaginable. What are you going to do with it? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, 9 and 10, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Dear people, whether you have realized it or not, you're in a desperate and dangerous situation, and you need help. But dialing 911 won't save you this time. There's only one who can respond and rescue. You need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ. The God-man who was born of the Virgin Mary, grew up and lived a sinless life and willingly offered himself up for you and I. 
And so if you haven't been saved by Jesus, then I urge you to consider your great need for Him and His great love for you. I urge you to consider your desperate situation and His selfless sacrifice and to call out to Him to rescue and redeem you. And if you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then what incredible reason you have to celebrate today. And what confidence and hope that you can have in a God who enters into the messiness and the brokenness of our lives to help us and heal us. And that goes beyond just Christmas Day. Houston Baptist Church, from birth to death, Jesus was answering our call. He responded, he rescued And one day he'll return and his rescue will be complete. He continues to save and rescue us each day. He's saved and redeemed us. And one day our salvation will be complete. We'll spend eternity with him in glory. We'll be saved not only from the power and the consequence of sin, but from its very presence. This is the hope that we can cling to in the hardest and darkest times. This is the hope that we can proclaim with loud rejoicing to this world. And this is the hope that captivates our hearts and minds when we think about that precious baby boy being laid in a manger. Our God rescues. Our God redeems. Our God loves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us, for your great mercy and grace that you pour out abundantly. Help us see it, Lord. Remove the blinders. Remove the bitterness and the walls that we build up, the hardness of heart that we cultivate. Lord, forgive us for that. Remove it from us. Cleanse us. Lord, make us a people that... Shine your light bright into this dark, lost, dying world. You've given us hope, hope eternal, hope everlasting, hope even beyond comprehension. A hope that should fill us with joy and song each day. And God, you've given that to us to be ambassadors of that hope to a world that is largely hopeless. You've given us truth to bring into a world that is truthless. And at this time of year where we celebrate the birth of our Savior, what a glorious thing. Don't let us keep it secret, a treasure hidden away, buried in a field. Lord, help us, encourage us, and strengthen us that we would go out and that we would boldly proclaim the wonders of salvation, the glory of the gospel. That we would tell people of their need for you and of the birth of a Savior who came and died for them. Lord, fill us with hope and peace and joy and love. Thank you, God, for your great faithfulness to us. Thank you for this time together today. We adore you. Lord, draw us closer to you, we pray. Amen.
May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go in peace and join us downstairs for fellowship. And come tonight at 6 for our Christmas Eve service. you